Shri Bari take immense pleasure in opening the penultimate session for the second day of this seminar by introducing Mr. Robin Banerjee, the Managing Director of Comprehense India Limited. Mr. Banerjee is a proud alumni of University of Calcutta and the Institute of Chartered Accountant of India. Mr. Robin Banerjee has been the Managing Director of Comprehense India Limited, a subsidiary of Bellicare Limited since 2013. He has served in several multinational global corporations in senior leadership positions, including Hindustan Unilever as GM, Arcelor Mittal Germany as MD and CFO, Thomas Cook as Executive Director, Isar Still as Executive Director, and Suzlon Energy as Group CFO. He has authored several books, the same one title, Who Cheats and How, Scams, Fraud, and Dark Side of the Corporate World. I would, I would now like to invite Sir to take over the charge of this session. Sir, the dais is all yours. Thank you. So my topic today, I wanted to talk to you about uh, is ethics in business. And actually, I'm not going to talk about ethics in business. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about the lack of ethics in business. Ethics in business is because of corporate governance, every company must be managed well. There are big companies, newspapers. There are companies who, you know, you, you see the CEOs on the top cover, including you know, corporate citizens winning awards, golden beard, perhaps golden bruises. But is there a corporate governance? Does these companies fall in corporate governance? Or are businesses run either in India or abroad in ethical manner? What do you think? Are businesses run in India or elsewhere in ethical manner? If you think yes, raise your hand. In ethical manner. Unethical manner? My topic has ended. <laughs> so, um, just imagine that most of you believe that businesses are not run ethically. Unfortunately, it is true. So, uh, because unfortunately it is true, I thought it is something which is not talked about. It is not discussed. It is hidden on the carpet. Why is it hidden on the carpet? Not many countries hide it in the country, uh, under the carpet. Many countries challenge it, they are challenging it. It is hidden on the carpet in India because India is an unethical country. India is uh, by and large, by and large. By and large, uh, corruption, bribery is a way of life. So, um, given this background, uh, corporate governance or whether all the organizations follow a good corporate governance is a big challenge. It wasn't perhaps being discussed earlier as much as it is, is being discussed today. Two biggest, and I know maybe I will bore you, but I'll tell you some stories today. But before that, I just want to upfront tell you that the whole issue of corporate governance came on the newspapers over the last few months is when uh, uh, Mr. Cyrus Mistry got sacked from Ratan Tata, which to my mind is a corporate governance fiasco. We can debate to the house go home who is right, who is wrong, but that brought the whole issue of governance and its principle. Can the chairman of the largest conglomerate be fired overnight without giving notice, uh, perhaps for not doing a bad job? And uh, number two, it also came out openly when uh, Mr. Narayan Murthy of Infosys, ex-chairman of, uh, of Infosys, who actually created, along with his friends, uh, Infosys what is today, he said, you know, my CEO, he doesn't run, which is Mr. Sikha, doesn't run the company for unethical manner. He's not an unethical guy, I made a mistake, he should be sacked. And uh, that came out right in the open. Believe in me, this is going on in hundreds and thousands of organizations. It is just these two organizations came out in the open, for whatever reasons. Had it not come to the public domain, you wouldn't, we wouldn't even know that there are corporate governance challenges in India. And believe in me, the worst news is the corporate governance challenges came to the, to, in India of the two most well, best governed companies in India. If you, five months, six months before, if you would have taken a poll, which is the best governed group in the world, in the country, Tata's and Infosys would have been number one, number two. And today we realize both the chairmen say, oh, come on, there is no corporate governance in that country, sadness here. 
<clears throat> so that matter is very serious. Most of the issues of ethic, ethics and non-ethics and non-ethical practices are within the boardroom. It is within the four walls. You and me don't get to know. Therefore, uh, my dear friends, I'm going, be, I'm, I'm going to tell you two or three stories. Stories of <coughs> unethical practices which has happened, uh, which has shaken the world, and which has changed the world of business. And I'm aware some of you, or maybe most of you, are non-finance. I am not. I am not going to give you finance stories. Every business is all about finance. Business is all about making money. Business is all about making money, hopefully ethically. And by then someone starts making money unethically, and that's where our this problem is. So I will tell you some stories. You have not heard the story the way I'm going to tell you. But many of you would know about it. It's all in the public domain. Whatever I'm going to talk to you today is all in the public domain, all known. But perhaps in very detailed stories, you make it a little flower in some form, just to make it a little more interesting. <coughs> so let me tell you the story number one. All of you ready? Yes. Concentrate if you can. I do understand 60 minutes talk, you can't concentrate every moment. So I try to repeat certain sentences here and there that I think you have not heard and see if you can understand. If you, could, if you can understand the three stories uh, and the, the, in, the implications thereof, which is very important, the implications to you and me, each one of you sitting in this room will have some implication of the story which I'm going to tell you in, in your life. Uh, hopefully then there will be some takeaways uh, for you to take away from the seventh session of today. Uh, the story number one goes like this. <clears throat> I'm going to first tell you a story of international development. <clears throat> because this has singularly changed the way uh, the world does this history. This international story is all about the United States, but it has affected India, by the way. And it's all about banking. Uh, in the late 1990s, about 90s, 1980s, 1990s, uh, the American government decided that um, each American must get a home. Each American must get a home. Now, America is a capitalistic economy. It is not a communist country. Had it been China, by the way, China is not communist anymore. I hope you know that. But had it been China in the olden days, government would have given homes to people. And said, no, I have given homes, lousy homes, go and stay there. America won't do. America encourages customers or its citizens to buy old homes. But how do you buy a home? You don't have money. So what you do? You go to a bank, you borrow, excellent. You borrow, you go to a bank, borrow money for either building a home or buying a home. So American government says, come on, Mr. Banks, start giving give loans. So they started giving loans. When they started giving loans, they found that the people who are coming to take loans, most of them, are incapable of returning the loans. Because people who could take loan has already taken. It is those who did not, who does not have the ability to return the money have not taken it. So they were the people who were the target audience, target customers. So when the American banks found that the loans are being given to people, so first of all, they started giving loans, lots of loans and lots of loans to people who have no ability to repay. So when the American government, when the bankers started realizing that these loans which are given are unlikely to be repaid, bankers, you know, are very intelligent people. Many of you will join banks. So the most intelligent of you will join banks. And then, of course, you will have intelligent way of making more money. So these bankers thought that let me, let me do something. And this is the difficult part of it. Just try to understand. It's all common sense. It has nothing to do with finance, because everything is common sense. And if you can think, think for how they have structured a fraud or not an unethical practice, maybe the things will become clearer to you. So now the difficult steps. Banks gave loans to people whom they knew they are not going to repay. But when the banks were giving a loan, they had a mortgage of the house, which means you give a loan against the security. If I want, let's say, 500 rupees, I go to her and say, can you give me 500? Take my watch. He said, okay, watch is worth 1,000. Punch it okay, level. So when I give this watch to her, then it is a mortgage. I give my watch as a security and she gives me 100 rupees or 500 rupees. This is a typical situation. 
Now, if I don't return my 500 rupees in due course, let's say one year from today, she has the right to sell my watch, which is 1,000 bucks, and recover 500. Hopefully, she will return my 500 balance, or maybe she will pocket the 5,000 itself, whatever the situation is. This is what happens for housing loans also. Whenever you take a house loan, then the house gets mortgaged to the bank. That means the original property documents remains to the banks. Having said that, the, the bankers knew that the house is mortgaged to me. Now, as the house loans were being given, more and more people were bouncing homes, buying homes. As more people bought, started buying home, the house prices started climbing. And I don't know whether you remember, you are quite young, of course, you would not be knowing. Between 1982 to 83 to 1987, all over the world, especially in America and Europe, house prices started spiraling. And when the house price started spiraling, the bankers were very happy. Bankers said, all the loan levels, they did it. Let me give more loans. Why? Because as I'm giving more loans, house prices are going up. And if there is a default, by the time house prices have already gone up, I will be able to sell the house at a profit and recover my money. So there is no risk. Have you understood? Yes. More loans, more housing bought, house prices are going up. Bankers were very happy. They started giving more loans because the house prices were spiraling and they thought in their mind that I will be able to sell the property and make money, profits actually, forget about any losses. Uh, but as I told you, bankers are very, very intelligent. Then around 1983-84, they, they thought that fine, it's all okay, but what if the people who have taken the loans does not, does not return? Because we know the borrowers are incapable of returning. So what should I do? Let us say, for instance, Bank of America has given a loan. And he is under the illusion, the Bank of America is under the illusion that the house price is going up and therefore there is no risk. But they are intelligent, they say, nay, risk to have. Because the person to whom I have given the loan, that fellow is incapable of paying. Forget about the property value. So the, prop, the loan which is sitting on my books, I must put it on somebody else's books, which means if the loan Bank of America has given, it is sitting on my shoulder, can I transfer from my shoulder to somebody else's shoulder? This is what they wanted to do. It's not difficult, I'll tell you how what they did. Again, common sense, nothing to do with finance. Not, of course it is finance, but nothing to do with high-tech finance, which finance guys will tell you, it's high-tech finance, you will not understand. You will understand. Now, so what they did, think about it, these housing loans which they gave, it's called subprime mortgage loan. You must have heard this word subprime mortgage loan. Subprime means that it is not prime, it is subprime. The chance of recovery is very low. But these banks would also have prime loans, like it would have also given a car loan, and a good house loan, a good credit card loan. So what they did physically, these bankers, they took the subprime mortgage loans, which was 90%, they took 10% prime loans, which means group loans, and they made a kitchen. Please understand, literally they mix together. When you give a loan, it's a paper. Okay? At the end of the day, the loan has gone to your bank. But what it remains is a piece of document. These documents were mixed together, and they prepared another document, which had majority, not majority, 90% almost, subprime kachra loan. Subprime loan is nothing else but kachra loan, which is recovery is almost negligible possibility and the 10% good loans they, they put it together and they named it finance guys would have heard this or finance professors sitting there would have heard this called CDO CDO collateralized debt obligations correct collateralized debt obligation now this is the very very popular stuff and you will keep reading at CDOs CDOs are being done today. There is another cashier coming up there later on, which I will tell you later, not today. <laughs> Something again is growing, but that apart, CDO. Then what they did, then what they did, these CDOs, they went to credit rating agencies. Have you heard of credit rating agencies, Moody's and SLPs? Standard and Poor's and Moody's, they went there. And they said, can you rate it? They said, of course. They rated it triple A. Triple A means AAA is the highest rated, that means risk-free, almost risk-free. The loan will always be repaid. AAA, AA, single A, triple B, single B, double B, B, 
triples, double C, C, and then come D. D is default. So it's triple is right there, D is default. They rented this triple A. Having rented this triple A, which is very risk free, these are risk free bonds, risk free CDOs, they went to an insurance company. And they got this CDO insured. And company, insurance company like AIG insured. Not finishing with this, not finishing with this, they went also to semi government banks like State Bank of India, India semi government bank. In America, this is called Freddie Bank and Fannie Mae. They went there and got it guaranteed, semi guaranteed. So this CDO, which in the bank's books are risky, unlikely to be recovered, think they got it triple A rated, where by the way, both C Moody's and SMPs knew it is not to be rated, so it was an unethical practice. Then it got it insured, then they got it guaranteed, and then they had a piece of paper in their hand, which is mortgage backed, triple A rated, insured, guaranteed by semi government banks sitting with them. And then they went all over the world, including ICICI in India, say that, would you buy this piece of paper? What does banks do? Let's say ICICI. They take your and my money as savings, and they give that money as loans to businesses. But 100 rupees they take, they don't lend on 100, as you know. They have to invest some money also to somewhere. So they need good papers to invest. And the CDO of American Bank of America, let's say, which was triple A rated, guaranteed, it sure is a great investment. So ICICI, I'm giving an example, bought CDOs. All over the world, hundreds and thousands of banks bought these, these CDOs. The total value of the CDOs were those days, that's about almost 1986. Uh, two, so 2008, I'm sorry, 2007-2008 was two trillion dollar. Two trillion dollar is the GDP of India. Instead, it's 1.8, 1.9. This loans all over the world, city. So it has gone from the Kandha on the shoulder of Bank M or Citigroup, Citibank or JP Morgan to the other banks all over the world. Come 2008, these some bankers, young bankers saying, you know, these loans which we have given, nobody is repaying. What should we should do? So they started saying, Mr. X, you are supposed to have taken a mortgage loan. Are you not, you are not paying the interest, you are not paying the principal, when are you going to pay? So, sir, I am not ready to pay. So then they said, that, okay, then I have to sell your house. And they said, recover. So what the bankers did, think, please understand, focus on it. The banks started selling the houses. Just a few months before, they were giving loans, people were buying homes. Houses prices were going up. Suddenly, the banks started selling houses to recover the loans. So when the banks started selling houses to recover the loans, what happens? The house prices crashed. Have you understood? More houses available, nobody to buy, nobody to buy, house prices crashed. When the house prices crashed, Suddenly, that means the mortgage behind that CDO is no longer valu valuable. For instance, you had a housing loan of 15 lakhs and you had a mortgage worth 15 lakhs. But when the house prices crashes to 8 lakhs, the 10 lakhs is not getting covered. That's what happened. The house prices crashed. The mortgage becomes uncovered. That means the piece of paper which is sitting in ICICI is also uncovered. Overnight in 2008, the CDOs became toilet papers. Uh, Moody's and S&P withdrew the AAA rated rating overnight. In the insurance company EIG said, "Our pass paisa nahi hai, to delete liya. I can't give insurance." So insurance company EIG became bankrupt. And Freddie Mac, Freddie Mac said, "This guarantees have no meaning because I have no money anyway." So all over the world, all over the world. These CDOs, which were structured incorrectly, unethically, and fraudulently, the bankers knew that they are going, they are structuring something which is not payable, not refundable, sorry, not recoverable, took the whole system for granted. 
Now what happens? The world banks are holding this piece of paper, large sums of money, billions of dollars. This happened around 2008, August, September. And they realized that I have to now cut losses. So what banks do? Banks then suddenly stop giving loans. And when the bank stop, stops giving loans, including to some extent ICICI, it stopped giving also, although that did not affect India as much, as much as it affected ex externally. When they stopped giving loans, the, 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 the cycle of business stopped, which means that for running a business, you need money. When you go to the bank, I need more working capital. Bank said, no, I have no money. I stopped shop. I have no money. So the business came to a halt. When the business came to a halt, the biggest financial crisis in the world happened, which is 2008. Do you know the biggest financial crisis in the world is 2008? The whole world came to a standstill. The prices depressed. Unemployment went up. The world collapsed. And it took about, let's say, till last year, it's about six to seven years the world has taken to recover. And the result of what was an unethical practice fraud by the banking system. Have you understood? This ends my story number one. Any question? So in short, the biggest financial crisis of 2008 which has not happened since the Great Depression of 1920s was a result of a, of a corporate fraud, of not a corporate fraud, of corporate frauds created by the banking sector. That ends my story. So you can well imagine how the world has shaken and how, of course, the implication of hopefully now, once you go back to your real life, you will be able to understand now when you read newspapers or your business magazines or economists or your, uh, or your, or your um, study material, you should be able to understand why the world's banking system is now being at least tried to run differently. They are saying there are banks which are too big to fail and so on and so forth. It's all because of this fraud which has happened and, and, and knowing the bank system. And there are lots and lots of stories. Lots and lots of stories. I've written a book on this. This is the book. That's why I brought it. I brought it in order to show it to you. There's no other reason. It's the Huchi Tsuna. It's available in the public domain. It's available in Amazon. It has 350 such stories. With names. And it is 50% discount now because of Amazon, whatever, gift card, um, they want to sell. It costs me maybe around 250 rupees. I suggest there are some books in the library, I think. But it would be nice to have it because you will. It will be a good experience to know what the corporate world is. I'm not selling the book. The book is already sold. But I have, I wanted to tell you, my dear friends, that it is important to know what this world is all about. And, you know, you need to spend 250 rupees for various things. Be worth it. And read this book over and over again. You can't, it's very simply written. You can read any page you want. Any page. Just open a page and you start reading. If you don't like it, Put another page. It is not be read right from top to bottom, and there are 350 stories in there. I will tell you the third story. Um, the third story is about pharmaceutical industry. As you all know, India has India's largest exporter is IT. The second biggest is textile, and third is pharma. And pharma industries, unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately, uh, interspersed with some poor uh, governance principles. But I tell you one story what has happened, and again, it is a public domain. Have you heard of the name called Ranbaxi? Yes, sir. Uh, Ranbaxi, once upon a time, is the number two uh, pharma company in, in India. Ranbaxi has since been sold to a Japanese company. The Japanese company did been a fraud, did not disclose certain things. And since then, again, it has been sold to the Indian company. So whatever, be as it may. Uh, Randaxi was running, <coughs> was exporting uh, pharmaceutical products to the US. And when they were exporting pharmaceutical products to the US, uh, US does not take, uh, that takes pharma products very seriously. 
So they say, you can't give us nonsense. Uh, you and me in India, of course, we, we perhaps take medicine which is nonsense, but they will not take it. So the US FDA, Foods and Drugs Authorities, I hope you know the name, United States US FDA, uh, was thinking that something is amiss with red vaccine. Uh, but that was okay, nothing was wrong. The red vaccine was basically exporting goods to the US, declaring that their products were as per norm and their effects were within the means, within the within the tolerant, tolerant level. And the tolerant levels for US is very high, that means maybe not more than half a percent uh, inaccuracy. You can have 99.5% products must be at par, at par with the with the chemical uh, requirements and standards. When actually employed an Indian in the United States as their R&D director. This R&D director, having joined the US, he was under some sus suspicious suspicion that I get all data from India but can India data be so clean? When, whenever I get a data from India, everything is clean, everything is fine, but that's possible. But he was harboring this in his mind, was thinking, what is something really amiss? That's okay. He couldn't do anything. Then, his daughter fell sick. And he had to get some sort of a specialized antibiotic, which was manufactured by Fairbanks. He is an MPAC's employee, he is an RMD director. So he gave that medicine to his daughter for three consecutive days, and the daughter's fever, or whatever the problem was, would be subsided. Then he said he changed the brand. As far as I remember, he shifted to Black Super, I don't remember exactly the name of the company, perhaps it is. He shifted the name, uh, he shifted the product to another multinational company a brand, and the daughter's fever came down in the first dose. First dose. And that created He said that means the products which are being exported to the US is incorrect, is not as per standard. He did whistleblowing. You understand whistleblowing? He completely wasted it. And he said, this is what has happened. I believe it is, you must check. USFDA, one fine morning, without notice to run vaccine, came at the factory gate. I, I don't know whether you have ever gone to a pharma company. Pharma factories are like prison, you can't really have no chance. But they flashed early morning, 7 o'clock, before the managers come in. They flashed, they flashed their visiting cards and they had to enter, they had to get out. You know, they must have called someone, he said, yes, 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 They didn't know what they had come for. And they went and straight to the quality department, opened the register, and they found that everything is manipulated. The RAN vaccine is to prepare and maintain a duplicate register. Actual register will have all defects, then they will correct and prepare a duplicate register. And that duplicate register will show everything correct was then sent to the RAN vaccine's factory was bad. The second largest factor was bad. And till date, India is undergoing that stress of that unethical practice. What US is saying, or for the matter anybody in the world is saying, if the if the number two company in the world in India can do this, anybody can do it. Everybody must be doing it. How do I win? How do I how do I believe an Indian pharma manufacturer's records. And when the basic thought comes to the Masamun's mind, that how do I believe you? Who? Can you believe it? What can happen? That, that the whole edifice collapses. When the trust goes away, no business can happen. And that to pharmaceutical. Since then, this of course, Landbacks has accepted, by the way, in 2014, yes, I cheated and paid a half a billion dollar fine. 500 million dollars fine, half a billion dollar fine is paid. But they have paid, I don't know whether they are sorry or not, 
but this is a single most important episode. Since then, pharma exports, of course, has collapsed to a large extent. Every pharma companies are getting repeat audits. They are, they, are, they are not accepting pharma companies as they are today. And Indian pharma export perhaps will take now maybe years to recover from this corporate fraud. That ends my story. How unethical Indian businessman could be not only to affect his or her industry, but it has affected the name of the country. Our flag has been tarnished in front of everybody, and it's the public domain. This whole thing is the public domain. Anybody and everybody knows this is what Indian manufacturers industry does. Isn't it a sad story? So that ends my story on the as I said, there are loads and loads of stories. I can keep telling throughout the night. Um, I will take questions now, so that we have sufficient time, maybe 10 minutes or so. But before I get into my story, I just wanted to highlight, because just to put the stories together, that when you, the young boys and girls, the future of our country, all of us will have a, perhaps be reading something called corporate governance. All of you will read corporate governance, will appear for the exam, will write a story, will write an answer, have a debate, maybe preach something, write in your mobile. But what is corporate governance? Have you understood what is corporate governance? Ladies and gentlemen, corporate governance, actually, when you read, unfortunately, the books and newspapers, it would mean that how many directors are there in the company, how many independent directors are there in the company, does the directors meet once a quarter, does the directors have the minutes of the meeting, is there a balance sheet profit loss account audited, are they filed with the register of companies? No. A director's can be any number of times, there could be any number of independent directors, there could be all the audited balance sheet and profit loss account. But if I do my little bit of thoughts, how will the corporate governance help, the, the regulations help? The big story of corporate governance, my dear friends, is a company should be able to produce good quality product at a consistent pace and consistent quality of product. If a company can produce a consistent quality product at the right price, the corporate governance is fine. The problem is, a company cannot produce consistent quality goods and services to the satisfaction of customers if the corporate governance is not given shelf shift. If the corporate government is compromised, no company can ever produce consistent quality goods. You just think of someone and you can think of a restaurant. Think of a restaurant which you want to visit. The last time when you visited a restaurant which you liked the food, you want to go and enjoy the same food. But if the restaurant chef or the sous chef is not following the corporate government, that means he's perhaps using instead of olive oil, mustard oil, the same quality will not happen. It's a corporate government chef. He has started with, uh, trying to make money of mustard oil versus olive oil, and he will not get the same test. Corporate government com compromise, quality compromise, we shall not get the same quality satisfaction. And that is all that matters. Corporate governance is a matter of running a company well. Everything else you read is a process to provide customer satisfaction. And a very important participant in the stakeholder satisfaction is the employees. If a company has satisfied employees, and this is for the HR colleagues of mine here, if a company has satisfied employees, you know, good place to work, best place to work, why is that encouraged? Chances are that they are the great corporate governance. You cannot have good corporate governance, cannot have satisfied employees where corporate governance has not been taken care of. So basically think of two things, actually three. One, the product and quality is good and consistent. Two, the employees are looked after well. And three, the vendors and creditors are paid on time. If these three are happening, 
corporate governance taken care of. Everything else, either in the companies that or in the city roads, believe me, is all trash. Very important. Remember, this perhaps will be the overarching understanding of ethics and corporate. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Partho Roy and I am from BMHRD. So, my question is that, uh, firstly, uh, your stories are very fascinating and very interesting. Thank you for that. And secondly, uh, you mentioned two things, like about Raghuram Ranjan and demonetization. So, sorry, Raghuram Ranjan. So, uh, recently he published a book called I Do What I Do. And he wrote many things like, there are also adverts, means effect of demonetization. So, I want to know your views about that. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Raghuraman Rajan's book is a very good book, but that book is an assimilation of his speeches given while he was in India. So it really does not contain or consist of the after effects as it is. We thought he would comment upon it, that what his take on the monetization GST is. Of course, there are two views, but I will give you my view, and I am a businessman. What has demonetization done? It's a, what is cash? Cash on which you have not paid tax. Two, you will have wealth which is stashed abroad, like Switzerland, Dubai, Singapore, wherever. Or three, you will have Benham properties. That means you have land and building in the name of your servant, your driver, all that belongs to you. It is the name of the servant, it is called Bidami properties. If these three can be attacked, all that money comes out. So what they have attacked, they have attacked cash, which is the bit, which is the demonetization. They said 85% of money is in high denomination notes, high demonetized. So that was attacked. What happened? 15 lakh crore was the amount which was cash available in the system, and 15 lakh crore has come back in the system. That's the criticism. When you, when you see the newspapers, people say that 15 lakh crore was given, 15 lakh crore has come back. Government said they are going to get 3-4 lakhs of black money. But it's good. 15 lakh crore, when the government gave or the banks gave, it was in the public system. The 15 lakh crore has come back in the banking system. So every money now has got accounted for. So whoever now will use the 15 lakh crore will have to pay some tax. So just imagine, overnight, in 45 days time, the whole economy becomes accounted for. Great move. So the 15 lakh free versus 15 lakh in my mind is a, is a story we are giving to divert the tension to the main issue that everything has not become accounted for. Number two, money stashed in abroad and our Prime Minister had said that I will bring the money from abroad. Bringing the money from abroad is not up to us. Bringing the money from abroad belongs to the government. The Swiss government has to approve and agree that I am going to give you information which they have started. Already a big list has may have come, I think more than 120 names with the numbers that so much money is stashed away. This is something which the Indian government can only do and it will take four to five years to convince those banks because if those banks are having Benami or, or black money, why should they give up their bank deposits? They are doing business, Switzerland is doing the business. So therefore they will obviously resist and they have to keep fighting and get the money. So the movement has started, public debate has started, it's in the public domain, hopefully something will happen. Some movement has already started taking place, which is a good news. The third one, which the government is yet to attack, in my view, is the Benami properties. If the Benami properties as an attack, the whole black economy gets over. This is the story. As we got GST is concerned, what has GST done? GST is done simple. Everything you produce and sell, you must have a number. You produce, you sell, you have a number. I buy, I must buy with a number. Which was not true before 1st of July. I could buy from anybody. Now whenever I have a number, this is called the GST number, goods and service tax number, my production and sale and my purchase is all accounted for. If I have to pay 18% tax, I pay. If I am exempt, I am exempt. The whole economy from 1st of July becomes accounted for. Which means the unorganized sector becomes organized sector. Good, bad, I leave it to you guys to decide. So that's the impact of the economic question. Cheers. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. I'm Sagar Baba from BIMHRD. Sir, it's nice to have you back. 
So previously you uh, talked about the point of negative rate of interest. My question is related to something to that. So my query is that uh, countries are like countries like Japan, Sweden, Switzerland has negative rate of interest. What's the main philosophy behind having negative rate of interest? Why would they don't have want have people to not encourage people to invest in banks? Excellent question. I hope you know there is negative rate of interest prevalent in the world. <laughs> what is negative rate of interest? In India, if you give money in the bank, bank will pay you. But in Japan, if you want to keep money in the bank, you have to pay bank. What does it mean? The banks do not want their money. What does it mean? They want you to spend. What does it mean? If you spend, there is more employment, more production, more manufacturing, more inflation. They want to encourage the economy to grow. Because the economy is not growing. But a bank will pay some other code. They don't need to be able to pay money. Just spend, man, go spend. That's the logic of negative. Do you understand? Simple. Very simple logic. Does it work? It's a billion dollar question. Economists actually do not know the right or wrong for anything. Till now, the economists do not know how to prevent poverty. What is the biggest problem in the world? The biggest problem in the world today is inequality of wealth distribution. There are too many rich and very, very many poor. Does anybody know how to get it right? The answer is no. No human being knows how to get it right. You read Lord Kings, he has said something else. You read Mr. Pickery, he said something else. Whom do you believe? So every government is trying to do their own stuff, but no one knows how to distribute wealth throughout the world. If this could have happened, our discussion today wouldn't happen at all. Economists still don't know what is right or wrong to get inequality or for the matter, the, the fix of our malady. There is no right doctor or a group of doctors who knows yet our sickness and how to get it right. What is the antibiotic? Answer is no longer. It's not an available. Thank you, sir. We are grateful for the time and effort you took to share your thoughts and experiences with us today evening.